Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be here, and a disclosure is in order right at the outset. I've had the pleasure of teaching uh, Prashant some 20, 25 years ago, and curiously, uh, another 20 years ago, I had the pleasure of teaching his father. So I'm a biased party, and uh, the part of the world I come from is very difficult for me to Nepal uh, to be treated as a different country, and please don't misunderstand me. Uh, we belong to the part of India where we were ruled by Nepal. And if I could have a halfway decent education, is because my ancestors, a few generations removed, were treated very well by the occupiers of Nepal when Uttarakhand Kumau was part of Gorkhali. And he has written a brilliant book. And uh, when we are discussing this, how to, how to proceed, we have a few problems. I mean, I have a, he, will, he will forgive me. Um, I, I have a problem with the title. He has written a scintillating, incisive, engrossing book, very stimulating, but the title says In Search of a Constitution. And the moment I think of this, I say, uh, is only Nepal the place which, who's searching for a um, constitution? What about us in India? We have had a constitution in place for almost six and a half decades. We have 100 amendments, and the constitution may be very well there, uh, but we have the advent of Mr. Modi and BJP, and a great divisive debate in this country that those who are ruling this country or those who are custodians of this country, constitution, who have taken an oath to protect the constitution, are probably subverting it. Now, no sides taken at this moment, but will the uh, quest end for Nepal if the constitution is in place or will the problems of our variety uh, continue? One small thing before I pass it on to pass it on to Prashant. Uh, as I said of my Uttarakhand connection, for me Nepal is Doti just across Kali River which is not called Mahakali there as yet. It is a small fast flowing stream in Jula Ghat and Darjula. Uh, he is very sympathetic to uh, the Malaysia uh, issue in Nepal. And my problem is that uh, we in Uttarakhand, uh, where the boundaries blur, international boundaries blur be between uh, Nepal and India, are very worried about what happens to us, the hill folk, when the plains people come in. And I think that is an issue. And then again, I, I have a problem with the idea of Nepal, like I have the Kilnanian idea of India, the Nehruvian idea of India. Is there one India or is there a myth of India? Similarly, isn't there a myth of Nepal? Most of us think, in, or think of Nepal as Gorkha land. But what about the Rais, the Limbus, the Chetris, the Bhutias, the Sherpas, and so on? And from Eastern Nepal to Western Nepal, probably there is greater diversity than we think there is in this subcontinent. So I would, uh, without much ado, pass this on to Prashant. And I think uh, he can treat it any which way. There are no questions going to be asked. And how he passes it on to Kai is his headache. Because Kai spent uh, four years of his life in Nepal when his wife was with the world back there and that is another issue which I keep thinking about uh, when I have nothing else to do or when uh, I force myself to think about who am I, am I Pahadi uh, with part loyalty to Nepal and he belongs to the Indian diasporic origins. Uh, what is the World Bank doing in Nepal? What has it been doing? What the Americans do in Nepal? What do the Chinese do in Nepal? And there is a constant headache which the Indians have. And the session just before this guy was holding forth brilliantly about CIA and the wilderness of mirrors. The Nepalese are very sensitive to what the Roy is doing in Nepal. And who's Roy in Nepal? My good friend Dr. Moni, who in his book uh, now is documented as having carried a letter to somebody. My another good friend and a student, D.P. Tripathi from JNU, who has friendships with um, half a dozen prime ministers, some presidents. Uh, so far, he has not disclosed his friendship with the erstwhile royal family. But all of us have a take on Nepal. We should not burden you with that. And over to you, Prashant. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think we've hit the ground running uh, because uh, uh, Professor Pant has really dived into the issues. And, and the first question, the session's title, the book's title, by the way, is Battles of the New Republic, a Contemporary History of Nepal. The session's title is In Search of a Constitution. And, and the first question that Professor Pant asked is, is what's, what's the Constitution going to do? Will it make a difference? And, and I would uh, respectfully argue that, that it is going to make a difference. Uh, of course, there are many structural problems that will remain. It was, it is not the, it is not the one point solution for all else. But uh, the one constant political thread in Nepal since 1951 has been the fact that the people have never got to write their own constitution. Uh, it has been written by constitutional experts like Survivor Jennings came in 1958, or by uh, politicians constituted by palace representatives and uh, political parties. But uh, there has never been an elected constitution. 
constituent assembly and so the bill in some ways has never had a social contract of its own and uh, this is an opportunity for us to draw up the social contract and uh, drawing up the social contract is so important because Nepal is a very diverse country it has uh, people from many ethnic groups you know it has many people from many political persuasions now we are going through a civil war and uh, this this the primary goal of the civil war by the end of it, the Maoist insurgency between 86 and 2006 was the elected constituent assembly. Uh, Nepal has gone through a fundamental transformation in the past decade. We have moved from a war to peace. The Maoists now participate in open politics. We have moved from monarchy to a republic. We have moved from a Euro kingdom to a secular state. And we are moving from a military to a potentially federal setup. Now, why do we institutionalize all this? The place to institutionalize all this in a democratic setting is an elected constituent assembly. And <clears throat> we struggle with it. The elected constituent assembly failed the first time around, despite uh, its tenure having extended four times. Uh, there was a deadline, January 22 was a deadline, and we're still deeply polarized between different political forces, are deeply polarized. And uh, the quest for a constitution uh, is, is, is been, the constitution has been very elusive, and this has been a difficult struggle. But I think the day it is written, what it will mean is that the Nepal will finally have a social contract which it can own. And uh, why is it difficult? It is difficult because unlike the 47 to 50 phase in India, where you wrote your constitution, uh, there was an ideological and political developments of one, uh, one stream of thought, which was leaders were emerged from the national movement, the NATO, and so on. So there were contestations that happened in the CA, uh, or CA, but uh, there was also this ideological dominance of, uh, of one party and one, uh, one leader. Or a few leaders. Um, could we have written a constitution in the late 80s or early 90s when there was this assertion of multiple castes, multiple communities, there was a fragmentation of the polity? Nepal was trying to write its constitution at a time when uh, the polity was fragmented, when there was an assertion of the subaltern in untimed uh, ways, and there is no ideological dominance. So for any one stream, there are other class conservative democrats, I call them, which have been a part of Congress and the Communist Party is actually conservative in Nepal, the UMA. And then, then you have uh, the radical social democrats, which is what the Maoists represent. The Maoists don't represent any uh, old uh, Maoist talent vision of, uh, of, of the state. So this contestation and how you fit in diversity, now within the constitution you might have it back. So I want to, 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 to just sum up and, and answer your first question, it will be a big achievement, it will uh, the bind us together in ways that uh, we have not been together. Nepal is, Nepal is the oldest nation state in uh, South Asia. We came together in 1769, but Nepal was unified in 1769, but we never became a nation. And, we, and, and that, that's what this process will uh, hopefully do. Uh, I will come back to the education, but maybe that's, that's, the, that's, that's the point where I'll push this to Kyle and ask him, you were there for four years, you were there at a time when the elections, I think, had happened. Uh, there was this contestation between the Maoist and the non Maoist political uh, class. What are your impressions? Well, first, I, I just want to say it's a real delight to be here to talk with Prashant. Um, but it would be a pretense for me to claim to have any expertise at all about Nepal. Uh, the only reason I'm here is that I'm an admirer of Prashant's, and I did live in Nepal for from for four years, from 2007 to 2011, covering many of the the years about which Prashant is is writing, and. Uh, it's an astonishing book for me precisely because I lived through it, uh, not understanding what was happening, <laughs> living through very confusing, dramatic, colorful events. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a complicated circus, and uh, Prashant has sort of dissected it. And I was particularly pleased in the book to see uh, how he did it, which is, it, it, this is not just a boring history book. It, it, he doesn't write it that way. He writes about himself. And so when he writes about the rise of the Madeshi influence during the constitutional process, he explains where he came from and the sort of domestic politics through his own life. And that makes it personal. Um, he also, what is really particularly astonishing to me is that, you know, uh, he 
is able to sort of capture the characters. And these are very colorful characters who have a political odyssey that is quite Shakespearean. These Maoists who come uh, from the jungles emerge in, in uh, just before I arrived in Nepal in 2006, Prashant had never been seen. There, his photograph hadn't been published. Uh, the, you know, the Maoist leader was an unknown figure. And he suddenly arrives in Kathmandu Valley. And uh, then there's Bhattarai, Babaram Bhattarai, uh, 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 New Delhi trained PhD intellectual who's been hiding out in the jungle and running this, this uh, revolution, uh, an extraordinary uprising. And Prashant is able to get close to these guys. This is what I'm really struck by. And I want to ask, um, how did you develop these two sources, these two figures? Really, you make them really part of the, the main characters in your narrative, and rightly so, because they are driving the agenda. They're driving the revolution, and they're succeeding in an astonishing way by bringing down the monarchy. And yet, in the end, it's they fail on a certain level, and yet the story is, I guess, unknown. But you begin at the beginning of the book, you, you tell a story about running into Babaram Bhattarai, who was then, I guess, the number two Maoist leader, uh, and he, uh, the bus breaks down on which he's traveling, and so you have to go on a 15 kilom kilometer trek with him, and you take the opportunity to interview him. <laughs> And at one point you turn to him quite provocatively, I think, and you say, well, Babaram, was it, was it worth it? Was all the lives lost during the, the conflict, uh, was it necessary? So that's my question to you, and I think I know the answer that you give, but I think that's one of the questions that's at the heart of the book. Uh, thank you, Kai, and thank you for being on this panel and consenting to be on this panel. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the perspective that you bring as a distant observer who was there uh, is, is very valuable. I mean, the two, two, the two questions you ask in some ways, one is whether the war was worth it. When I asked that question to Babu Ram, and, and it comes pretty early on in the book, uh, he says yes. Uh, and, you know, the, the Nepal had become a constitutional democracy, a multi-party democracy in 1990. 90, we, had a, we, had, we had elections in 91. And the Maoists went to war in 96. So this is a question that many liberal Democrats in Nepal ask. That, you know, why did you not allow democracy to flourish? Why did you not give democracy a chance? Uh, wasn't it too early to get so disillusioned? Uh, and uh, was it worth it? Now, uh, it's, it's a difficult question. And uh, I don't think there is a black and white answer. I, of course, do not like the fact that 16,000 people died, that there were 1,300 in forced, forced disappearances, that there is still no justice, and uh, there was massive internal displacement, and that uh, Nepal had through, had went through this, this convulsion. Uh, but look at what we got at the end of it. Uh, would a republic have been possible without the war? And I, I would say no. I don't think, I think Nepal would still have been a monarchy if we did not have the Maoist war. And uh, is the trade off worth it? I don't know. But should we have been a monarchy? No. I think it was time that we uh, became a modern uh, a democratic nation and, and there was this tension between monarchy and democratic forces. The monarch had never allowed democracy to flourish. Uh, at each instance in Nepali history, uh, the, the palace had intervened. And, and what the Maoist revolution did was it eroded the traditional social base of the palace, which was the, the, the upper caste landowning gentry of, the, of a rural uh, mid-hill Nepal. So that, that, and that, that was a substantial achievement. And I think the, the other achievement, and that's, that's what we began with, was the elected constituent assembly. The fact that, and this is not a Marxist demand, this is a bourgeois demand. 
an elected constituent assembly is not a Stalinist demand. And, and the fact is that our liberal democratic parties had not been able to do it. And they had compromised with the palace, and, and the Maoists were able to uh, institute this. The third achievement was the kind of political consciousness and awareness that the Maoists were able to create uh, uh, in Nepal. I mean, you go to any village, uh, any caste, you speak to anybody, and they are very sharp, sharply aware about their rights and uh, about the kind of structural discrimination that has happened in Nepal. And, and that kind of political awareness was, 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 I mean, it didn't exist earlier. Uh, the Maoists are in crisis right now. They have, have suffered a serious electoral uh, setback. Uh, they've split, and they are the three factions, the five factions of the original Maoist party, but three serious factions. Uh, so they've lived up to the South Asian communist legacy of not being together for more than 10, 15 years. Uh, but, but, and I don't know whether they will be able to revive, but I think the fact that Nepal is a republic, the fact that Nepal has an elected constituent assembly, and the fact that today Nepalis are so aware are substantial achievements. It has come at a cost. Uh, it would have, uh, that, 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 that was a very heavy cost that Nepal paid. And, uh, and perhaps it would, have, it would have been desirable not to have that cost, uh, that, that, that we, we, if we, we didn't have to pay that cost, we, it, would have been, uh, it would have been great. But politics is not black and white. There are trade-offs. And this is something that, that happened. The other question that you asked about uh, sources, and that, you know, uh, I was, Nepal is a small place. And uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, uh, it is not, uh, you know, if, if you are a political journalist, it is not that difficult to get interviews, for instance. Uh, what happened was that, you know, I was in this space where I was a columnist. And so I could freely write and express my opinions. And, uh, and that, I think, gave me a vantage point where I could, where I could take positions every week. And certain positions coincided with what the Maoists wanted. So sometimes it didn't. Uh, but that allowed me to develop a relationship with uh, leaders across the political spectrum and in the Maoist movement that perhaps a, day to, a reporter working on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is not able to develop because that, you know, the reporter is calling him for a scoop, for a leader for a scoop every second day. And, and my, my conversations with them were about deeper substantive issues. They didn't know I was writing a book. Uh, the first time Baburam got to know I was writing a book when I was when I called him and asked him whether he would launch it, and so all the conversations that were happening, you know, I was I was writing about it and I was noting it, and some of that got reflected in my columns. But uh, I don't know whether it's deception, but I never told them that this would eventually be in a book. So all many of these conversations were off the record conversations, which I, uh, I cheated a bit on them and I put it in the book. Well, I just want to emphasize for people who haven't read the book, though, that. What an achievement Prashant has made. He is sort of the Bob Woodward, if you're familiar with the American journalist, the Bob Woodward of Nepal. Bob Woodward in America has written all these insider books with access to anonymous sources and, and to you know, presidents and vice presidents and senators, and he tells the sort of inside story. And I, you know, you're right, Nepal is a small place, and so maybe it's easy to get interviews, but you're dealing with the Maoists, a secret organization, a party with factions, and, and then you're dealing with people who are royalists, who uh, have a very closed-minded attitude, I should think about journalists. And, and as you say, they didn't know that you were writing a book, but it, in, in any case, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, and uh, it, it's a window onto, a very valuable window onto understanding contemporary ne Nepalese history. Uh, let me ask another question. And, uh, the other thing that struck me ab about, about the book is that you explain how these Maoists, who they were imbued with Maoist ideology. They were revolutionaries. They had a vision for a radical change, not only eliminating the, the monarchy, but they were Maoists, and yet they made the compromises in 2007 and then 2008 and participated in the election. And they went a long ways to engage in bourgeois democracy, made compromise after compromise. And I, my sense living through it at the time was that the, the Brahmin establishment 
never believed it. They never believed that the Maoists were, were uh, serious about participating in, in democracy. Since the book has come out, what kind of reaction have you gotten from the establishment, the critics who uh, were always arguing with me that now these Maoists are who they are, they, they are revolutionaries, they're murderers, they're, uh, they're not politicians to be dealt with? You know, Nepal is deeply polarized, and Nepal has has been very polarized ever since uh, uh, you know ever since my political socialization began. Our first fault line was between monarchy and democracy, and uh, people took sides. And then there was this tension between Maoists and those who do not trust, trust them. The, the question that you raised, and then there was this uh, d deep tension between the vision of Nepal that different people had, whether it should be a unitary uh, hill Brahman-led state or whether it should become an inclusive federal democratic state. Now, uh, this is a book that takes positions. I don't pretend to, uh, I, have not, I have not written, no, I mean, I've tried to be objective in, when I recount what happened, but it, it's, a, it's a book that's sympathetic to the Maoist transformation. It is a book that's sympathetic to the idea of a federal inclusive democracy in Nepal. So uh, clearly those who do not agree with me uh, have not liked the book. And, uh, uh, and I've had some uh, nasty reviews, and I'm not a particularly popular person, I guess, in uh, many sections, especially the sections that control mainstream discourse in Nepal. But at the same time, it's been, uh, it's, it, you know, th I think there, there was a gap. There hadn't been uh, a non-fiction uh, English book on Nepali politics ever since Manjushri Thapa's excellent Forget Kathmandu. And uh, and this period had not been uh, documented. So uh, so the fact that this book does that, or attempts to do that, uh, filled in a gap. And, and I think that's why there has also been there have, well, there's also been a lot of positive reception. And you know people have picked up what they want to pick up. You know the the the, the, it, the book covers uh, the war. The book covers the peace process. The Madhesi movement. India's role. And uh, at, at, at some length, I document how the Ministry of External Affairs and the research and analysis wing uh, work in. So even if some people have not agreed with some part of the book, they've picked up some other part of the book to justify their own political positions. Uh, so, so yeah, it's been it's been it's been a mixed thing. Uh, thank you for that ex very generous comment on on uh, on how I have been able to track the inside uh, uh, Machiavellian. Uh, political uh, process in Nepal. Uh, I've attempted to do that because you know there's so much that the newspaper headlines do not tell us. One of the things that startles me in Delhi is how little people in Delhi, for instance, know what India does in neighboring countries and, uh, and how deeply enmeshed the Delhi establishment is in, uh, in fomenting wars, in, foment in mediating peace processes, in making prime ministers, in deciding who the director of the Nepal Telecom Corporation will be, in 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 all kinds of things, and and, and the book uh, attempts to also shed light on that. So so I hope it's uh, it's, it's, it's it, it fills in some gap. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you another question, uh, It goes back to the my original question. Actually, the supplement you have sought, you did mention in response to that something about the social contract. Now my problem is that does the social contract come automatically in place when the constitution is adopted? Or, I mean, I just can't get out of this problem that we have in this country. You have a constitution, but you, you have a, presumably, a democratic polity. But the social contract, the new social contract, is not in place. I would not quite agree to the proposition you make that when in, in the India adopted its constitution, there was a dominant ideological thing. Let's not also forget that when British left India, there were more than 550 princely states, which was not there. And we were not having the constitution adopted in 1950, just because the Constituent Assembly was there. There had been a whole history of constitutional development since the British colonial rule was here. So the Government of India Act was part of it, the Milo Monte Act was part of it. I don't have to go back to history lessons. But there was almost a hundred year plus history of constitutional development and electoral politics of sorts and the Government of India Act of 1935 and the rule two years. So that was one part. So I'm not so sure when the, there was consensus about major issues in the Indian constitution, it led to something. Then when it came to democracy in action, that consensus seems to have been lost. And I'm not talking of contemporary India. I think it was over by 1967, 68, when the anti-Congress wave came. 
and uh, Rajini Kutali's book became redundant. But let's get back to Nepal. Now, you made two interesting, I mean, I think very correct observations that it, the, the Maoist revolution had the impact of uh, changing things for or ever. You have now a republic, a democratic, and a secular democracy. But having declared yourself, either India or Nepal, a secular democracy, does it become secular? Does it become democratic? You may have free and fair elections like we have, but we have a deep, we Indians are very aware of it. We have a deeply flawed democracy. What Farid would call imperfect democracy, illiberal democracy, but we are not democratic as a society. We just have a demonstration of free and fair elections, and that's it. Nothing else changes as far as the rights of the people are concerned. You again made a very interesting um, and stimulating, as is your want, comment that now the people who had been exposed to Maoist were very sharply aware of their rights. So, doesn't it leave a cleavage in the society? where you are in limbo, the new social contract is not quite in place, constitution or not constitution. You also have a situation which is comparable to another neighbor of India, Sri Lanka, where the issue of revenge and reconciliation remains very much there. The Maoists may be given the credit, correctly so, of having removed the monarchy and removed the feudal regime and so on, but they, in the process, created wounds, and the scar tissue is not quite uh, painless. So you still have a problem, with, besides their fragmentation of uh, dealing with revenge and reconciliation. Related to this is a question, I mean, I, I'm sure you can retain everything, we've always been a very bright, good student. Uh, you talked about the book, and it has a beautiful, comprehensive view, as Kai said. I found it absolutely fascinating. But this is a book written primarily to explain tumultuous years in Nepal to the world outside, beyond India. What happens, is there something like this? Or is the book part of the vernacular discourse with all its diversity in Nepal, which tells them in a fairly objective way, like you've done dispassionate, without being involved, taking sides and so on, that this was what was happening around, and this is what has to be confronted, coped with, and each one of us in our different situation has to make peace with that. That's one part which I wanted, and can it be done? Uh, good friend Karakmani Dixit has come out with that, uh, the president of Nepal has come out with that, Others advising you, friendly countries advising you about what the constitutional uh, provision should be. So is this new social contract, can it be forged in isolation in Nepal? Or is it again, again being played undemocratically essentially? Uh, lots of thoughts there, sir. The first thing is that uh, in terms of uh, the contribution to the vernacular discourse, uh, the book is being translated into Nepali and it will be out in two months. So I hope, uh, I hope that, and you know, Nepali, unlike, unlike India, where English has become the language, has, has become the, is, is often the language of, has, has influenced far beyond its reach. Uh, Nepali is the primary language of public discourse in Nepal. And, uh, and I, ho I, the, I hope the book contributes uh, to that. Uh, there has also been a lot of good literature this year in English. And uh, this book, I, I see this book as a part of that. You know, there's an excellent book now out on the Maoist war. Uh, this is Aditya Adhikari's The Bullet in the Ballot Box. And it is the seminal account on the Maoist revolution. And, and uh, the, this book, my book, primarily deals with the peace process and what happened post their engagement in democratic politics. His book deals with the war. And I see it as, uh, we're also very good friends, and I see it as a book that, that compl we, uh, complements each other. So, and then there is another book, which is a biography of Kathmandu by Thomas Bell, who used to be the Economist correspondent. So there is now a lot of, uh, lot of uh, literature that's coming out of uh, uh, and about the p political process. Uh, you know, your, your point about the social contract, and uh, I would just say that, that there is there's some, something that has always been missing in Nepal is systemic stability. And what your constitution did, I mean, it is a flawed democracy, and Nepal is, a, is, a, is, is an even more flawed democracy. But what your constitution did, barring the emergency, was provide a degree of systemic stability. And uh, I'm all for disruption and revolution, but I think states need a degree of order as well. And I hope what this constitution does is provide that degree of systemic stability, which has this broad buy-in of different groups. So it has the broad buy-in of at least four major political forces of Nepal, which is the Nepali Congress, the Communist Party of Nepal, UML, the Maoists, and the Madesi forces, but also of three social groups, which is the hill-bound Chhetris, uh, the, the Madesis of the plains, and the Janjatis, the ethnic groups. So if there is a constitution that has this broad buy-in of different social forces and political uh, groupings, uh, it may help provide Nepal 
uh, this systemic stability that Nepal uh, has has never had. So I think that's the uh, uh, that that's that's the hope. No, I, I think the last part remains unanswered. That would Nepal be, if I may use the ugly word, allowed to forge this new social contract relevant for 21st century, or would there be unwanted interference, however politely, discreetly, obliquely exercised? by either India or other powers. You know, you know, I'm not a sovereignty fundamentalist. I, uh, one of the sections in my book is politics of partial sovereignty. We, uh, we have never been completely sovereign. Uh, look at the fate of the Himalayan states. If you look at Kashmir, uh, Tibet, Nepal, Sikkim and Bhutan, uh, China took Tibet, uh, India took Kashmir, India took Sikkim, Bhutan is a protectorate. We're the only ones who managed to at least retain a degree of sovereignty. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and remain an independent uh, state. Uh, and, and I hope that, of course, remains. And, and, and that, in that sense, I am a Nepali nationalist. But uh, the, the point is that uh, India and the West's engagement is, uh, the West is engaged in different ways through donor aid, you know, a lot of money comes in through, for development expenditure from the West. But the primary political, external political actor is India. Now, the relationship, and, and the relationship with India is very complex. Uh, we are overwhelmingly dependent on India. We share an open border. Everything from, uh, from salt to fuel comes from India. Uh, each political stream in Nepal has had links with Indian political movements. Uh, the Nepali Congress leaders fought in the Indian freedom struggle. The, the UML leaders were inspired by the, Japa, uh, by, by the Naxalbari movement. Uh, the Maoists had very close links with your PWG and MCC. In fact, uh, Prachand played a role in unifying the PWG and MCC and making them this unified uh, CPI Maoist. Uh, the, the monarchy had very close links with Indian princely families as well as the RSS. Uh, and then so, and the Madhesi leaders have close links with Bihar and UP politicians. This is not a relationship that can be understood in terms of uh, old categories of sovereignty. The, the, and I'm not even talking about the establishment yet. The establishment, which is represented by me and Raw, have, have a dominant influence. So to, I think that, and, and India has played a role in uh, mediating uh, the peace process and facilitating it. Uh, so uh, I don't think we will ever be in a situation where India doesn't have a role. India will have a role. The question is how does India use its political capital? Does it use it for deeply partisan ends to only back one side? Or does it use it constructively? Because the only external actor which has any leverage to produce or to help Nepal produce some kind of consensus over the constitution is India. So I, 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 I think India has to remain deeply engaged. I would, if, if India takes positions that, uh, that I don't like, for instance, if this government starts backing a Hindu Rashtra in Nepal, uh, I will deeply oppose it. But, uh, uh, as lo but that's, not the, that's, that's not what we have seen. Um, prime Minister Modi's visit to Nepal was very successful. He was the first prime minister to go in 17 years. His speech in the Constituent Assembly allayed apprehensions like nothing else. He, de he addressed Nepali insecurities. It was a terrific, terrific performance. And, uh, and he supported a federal democratic republican constitution. So I do see, I think if left to itself, uh, the, uh, I, I think the prospects for constitution, uh, I mean, finally it has a Nepali-owned process and, and Nepal has, Nepali parties have to do it. But I think uh, constructive Indian facilitation uh, is, is, it would be useful. Another small question I had, which uh, I think needs to be addressed. What do you think is the state of the reconciliation? You did, you did mention that. Uh, you know, there are two, 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 two elements to that answer. The first is uh, in, uh, with, in the context of the war. Uh, there were atrocities. I mentioned 16,000 people died, 1,300 and forced disappearances. And uh, there is uh, the peace agreement ha held that there would be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There is now a law that's been passed, but the commission has not yet been constituted. The tension, of course, is uh, between uh, the Maoists. Uh, the Ma this is one, one, one area where the Maoists and the army are on the same side. They don't want any, uh, any, any process that it would include prosecution for wartime crimes. Uh, there is, and I know this is a flawed uh, way to look at it, but in the popular conventional political discourse in Nepal, there is this perceived tension between peace and justice. That if you want to maintain peace, you let, by go, let, let it go. Uh, but of course, we know that that kind of peace is uh, not sustainable, that you need to address 
uh, wartime crimes as well, and you need to have a degree of justice. So the, the consensus, the emerging consensus is that you should have prosecution for certain, uh, uh, certain emblematic cases. Uh, where, uh, which had nothing to do with war, civilian torture, uh, rapes, uh, the, the, the disappearances. So, so, but, but we have not yet seen the, that process commence, and that has led to a lot of disillusionment and, uh, and, uh, and, of course, injustice. But the other element of reconciliation, if I can take a, take a minute and then pass it on to Kai, is that you know, this is also a society that's driven, driven by structural discrimination, right? Uh, the fact that one community or two communities, the Hill Brahman Chetris, the Hill Upper Castes, have had, uh, have had a dominant, uh, uh, have, have controlled the state. So the other reconciliation which is happening through the constitutional process is uh, drawing up the social contract where other communities have, uh, have space and, uh, and, and you create an inclusive democracy. So why, and that will address other kinds of, in, the other kind of injustice that has happened in Nepal, which is this uh, exclusion and, uh, and discrimination and the lack of dignity that many people have, uh, have had. So, so there is the wartime reconciliation process which has not commenced, which must, and there is this other reconciliation which must happen between different communities, Kai. I wanted to bring it back a bit to the end of the book where you have this rather extraordinary interview with Prachanda and you ask him, well, sir, can't hear? At the end of Prashant's book, he, he has this interview with Prachanda, the Maoist leader, uh, and he asks him, uh, well, sir, what mistakes did you make? And it's an extraordinary exchange as I see it. He answers rather bluntly and he lists three major mistakes. The, chief, the first of them I think was his resignation as prime minister uh, over the Katawal, General uh, Katawal's uh, defiance of, of his orders. And, and I think this is like a, a major turning point in my memory living through it and then the way you explain it. And of course it involves India. We're sitting in India and uh, what is the residue of the fact that the, the Maoist leader made this mistake? I, I, and I think it, it's quite right, it was a mistake on his part to resign so easily. Only nine months in, in office or 10 months in office and he, he walks away, and again, this is an extraordinary moment for a Maoist leader who's giving up power, which proves that he, they're willing to really engage in the, the bourgeois electoral game. Um, but the residue of this you know, must linger, both for, uh, for all Nepalis. So I, I, and, and then I guess we need to quickly open up to questions, but what does this portend for the future? Do, does Prachanda or Bhattarai have a future in a democratic Nepal, uh, you know the, the, the three mistakes that he that Prashant mentions. The first one is that you know the, the, the Nepali political process and the peace process was based on a certain kind of domestic consensus, and that domestic cons consensus involved the Nepali Congress and the Maoists. The Nepali Congress being the oldest democratic party in Nepal. That consensus broke when, after the 2008 elections, when Maoists emerged victorious, uh, the Maoists did not make Girja Prasad Koirala, a man we don't mention often now, but uh, an extraordinary leader who uh, shaped this peace process, passed away. And if he had not passed away, I think we would have had a constitution by now. Uh, Girja Prasad, they did not make him pre president. And that uh, broke the domestic political consensus. So that's the first mistake that Prashant mentioned. The second, and you're absolutely right, that was the turning point. Uh, Prashant thought he, he tried to dismiss the army chief three months before uh, the army chief would have retired, and the, and the army chief was not obeying civilian command, but uh, it was a huge strategic mistake because it, it really, it created this ground for suspicion that the Maoists wanted to take over the state and capture the state and take over the army and then in integrate uh, thousands and thousands of their combatants into the Nepal army. Uh, India's closest friend in Nepal is the Nepal army. India sees the Nepal army as an extension of its own security architecture. Uh, it seeks stability and predictability in the Nepal army's chain of command. Uh, India repeatedly uh, went and told Prachand, don't do it. Uh, we will not allow this. Uh, and Prachand 
and in some ways rightly so, said, it's none of your business. This is my country and I'm the prime minister. I will do what I want to do. He was responding to a very radical base within his own party which wanted to show that we can do something different. We, this is a break from the past. Uh, Kram Bhangata, they called it. And, uh, and he did it. And what, he, what that act did was that it alienated, India just mobilized the rest of the political class and the government was uh, reduced to a minority and then President resigned. And he has never been able to come back. And uh, it, it was just uh, needless because, uh, he, you know, uh, he made the mistake that the king made, which was you don't open up so many fronts at the same time. And he, he, he antagonized Nepali political parties, he antagonized India, he antagonized parts of civil society, uh, and he antagonized the security architecture, right? And then so, uh, uh, and then it's, it's been very difficult for him to come back. The third mistake he, he says he made, and this is ironical because right now the Maoist position is there should only be constitution through consensus, was that he, he, he says, in, and I write about this, he says I should have taken the contested issues of the CA to vote. Uh, the contested issues in the last CA, which uh, dissolved, expired in uh, 2012, uh, were never taken to vote. And at that point, the Maoists and the Madhisis and the Janjatis, the ethnic forces, had a majority. And they could have perhaps pushed a constitution, but he didn't take it to vote. And uh, he's, he regrets that. And today, of course, the position is that uh, don't do this by a vote, do it through consensus. Um, so yeah, so those are the three mistakes. What was it? The, uh, that's a very difficult one. I, I think it will be, you know, uh, the, the political cycles are very difficult to predict, predict in South Asia. The BJP had two seats in 1984, the BJP lost 2009 and everybody had written it off and Narendra Modi comes back with 282 seats uh, in, in a stunning electoral uh, victory. Uh, right now, if you look at the Maoists, they seem so deeply fragmented, divided, weak, uh, no agenda. I, uh, I mean. As of now, I would say it will be very difficult for them to uh, come back. They have, their organization is almost decimated. But, uh, but politics works in strange ways. And then Prachand, I would still say, is, 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 a, is one of Nepal's tallest leaders. I mean, this is a man who has been at the helm of a communist party for 30 years. He has uh, led a war. He has led the party through a peace process. Uh, within two years of emerging overground, within two years of people seeing who this man is, he becomes prime minister. Uh, you know, the, the, there are ups and downs, so I, I would not rule it out. But even if the Maoists don't revive, I would say that uh, they, they contributed substantially to one phase of Nepali history and uh, helped create a republic in this constituent assembly, which was, which was, which was a great achievement. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but before we throw it open to the floor, I'll allow myself a question. To be honest, two rather unrelated questions rolled into one. One is that let's wish Nepal be well, and we believe that's a democratic, secular republic. But democracy in this country, at least, is not synonymous with efficiency. It is not synonymous with lack of corruption. Both again divisive issues. So while the constitution might provide the institutional framework for stability, but actual implementation of the constitutional provision might lead to more instability and chaos like they are exper experiencing in some parts. The second question, which maybe you would like to comment when somebody from the floor asks, or you can take the question together with when they ask you from the floor. Uh, when Modi came to power in this country, he said that aspirational youngsters voted across caste, region, language, religion, etc. Now, do you see, your book primarily deals with the peace process, and Adhikari's book deals with the revolution, but let's assume that we are talking of Nepal after that today. Do you see some kind of a melding or melting of the kind of the ideological barriers getting down caste primordial identity loyalty is going away, and the young voting differently. And the Nepalese are a large diaspora. So what, like the Modi used the Indian diaspora abroad to his advantage electorally. Is there a hope or an expectation or a possibility of the Nepalese diaspora, not only in India, but all across doing this? I'll take the second question first, sir. The, you know, as right now, because Nepal is so uh, divided and polarized, I think that uh, for now people will uh, look at uh, look at identity categories while voting, but uh, there is one thing that unites uh, Nepalis, and perhaps that's the one thing that unites Indians as well: the search for jobs. Uh, the fact is that we have 500,000 people entering the workforce every every year. Uh, there are no jobs. Uh, we have more Nepalis in Qatar than Qataris. There are 400,000 Nepalis in Qatar. There are 400,000 Nepalis in Saudi Arabia. There are uh, almost a million Nepalis in Malaysia. 
and uh, there is no measure of how many Nepalis are in India. The government of India claims there are 6 million Nepalis in India, but we don't know because they're, you know, Nepalis don't need work permits here. And there is often this overlap between Nep and distinction that's not made between Nepalis and Nepali speakers of who are Indians. So, so, but even if conservatively, we can look at three to four million Nepalis who are working outside. 30%, almost 30% of our GDP comes from remittances. And uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this constituency uh, wants jobs. It doesn't care about uh, Marxism or, or, or social democracy or liberalism. What it wants is factories. What it wants is investment. What it wants is uh, employment. And, and that is going to become, and the Nepali political class is not being able to respond to this. And uh, society in that sense has moved with the state and the political class has not. And at some point, whoever articulates this political platform best uh, will emerge victorious beyond the categories that you mentioned. Uh, I, I lost your first question. What was that, sir? Oh, the implementation, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, look, you know, democracy is not efficient, but, uh, but, but monarchy was not either, and you know, right, so this, this is, I think the consensus, the one thing that Nepalis agree on, that we have no alternative to democracy, and this will be messy, all democracies are chaotic and messy, but that's how we learn, and that's how we'll move on, I mean, that's Thank you. Uh, I think we have 15 minutes for question and answer, so we can take probably four or five questions. We begin from first, yes. Kindly make your questions brief. Yeah. Hi. Uh, how do you see uh, India-Nepal relationships change with the change of government in India now? It's already been around six, seven months. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm within India, and I'm, I'm a journalist who now works in Delhi. I'm a critic of this government. But one thing I have to concede is this government has transformed Nepal-India relations for the better. It has, uh, uh, the, the Modi's, as I said, performance in the Constituent Assembly. A 40-minute speech did more for the India-Nepal relationship than three decades of uh, India, India's development efforts there. Uh, he, he, what he did was that, you know, there are deep insecurities that exist in the Nepali psyche about India because of India's overwhelming role and our dependence on it. Uh, and this, this, this is what provides fodder to the ultra-left and the ultra-right in Nepal to raise questions, to raise the anti-India political platform. Are we sovereign? That's a question that many Nepalis think about. And what did Modi do? He just went and said in the CA, Nepal is a sovereign country. And the entire constituent assembly applauded. It tells you so much about Nepali insecurity and all that was needed. That Nepal is a sovereign country and we will not interfere. Uh, Buddha was born in Lumbini, which, hap which happens to be in Nepal now. And, and there has been this Nepali conspiracy theory about how India wants to appropriate Buddha and how India is never recogn doesn't recognize that. What did Modi do? He just said Buddha was born in Nepal. This is the birthplace of, 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 of Buddha. And, and the, the, our cons elected constituent assembly applauded. So, you know, uh, very basic things which seem so minor. But uh, uh, he, he did a lot in bridging the trust deficit. So, but beyond the symbolism of it, uh, this is the first year in the, in the last six months when there has actually been movement on, on that elusive hydropower cooperation between Nepal and India. We have some say 83,000 megawatt potential, but definitely about 40,000 uh, plus uh, potential of producing hydropower megawatt. And uh, we produce 800 megawatts. Kathmandu is crippled. The, during the winters with 16 hour power cuts and finally two projects have kicked off uh, with India. Uh, and so I, I, see, I see a huge shift and uh, I hope that the Prime Minister's attention, I mean he's doing so many things but he does pay attention to Nepal and he has, uh, uh, he's, he's, uh, it's been a very significant uh, leap in the relationship. Thank you. Uh, there in the middle, the gentleman in the grey and blue square sweaters. We'll come back. We'll do one round and... Um, thanks for your comments and I look forward to reading your book. Um, the professor mentioned the social contract which Nepal is trying to build, but that will not probably come without a political bargain, if you will. So my question has two parts. In the past few years, we saw several little battles, how to integrate communist fighters, and which were reflective of a deeply divided pol polity. Now in the next few months, whether aided by uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Modi's speech and his gentle voting, do you see a political bargaining emerge which could lead to an acceptable social contract? A political bargain either between Madhesis and the Hill and, or whatever, some scenario for that. Um, you know, that's the process we are, uh, we are going through right now. And, you know, the, there is, the, the, what is blocking the Nepal constitution is the, dim, is the future of, uh, and the shape of Nepali federalism. Right, and uh, the, the, 
the demand for federalism came in from the Tarai. Uh, the people in the Tarai felt long excluded from the power structure. And the demand was that there should be one province across the east-west plains, right, across. Uh, that demand now has been moderated, and they say that they want two provinces. Uh, in the east, one, which, is, which would be Madhes, and in the west, Tharuat, which would be dominated by Tharus. The older Nepali political parties, led by Hill uh, social groups, have A, been reluctant federalists, they don't want federalism. B, if at all they the federalism is allowed, they would like federalism to be, uh, they would like federal states to be carved out in a way where, uh, the, where there is a north-south delineation instead of east-west, so where Hill and the Tara is integrated. Uh, they say this is more viable economically, the river basin moves this way, and so on. But uh, the Madhesis resent this because they feel that this will divide them, this will uh, erode their identity, and in all these states, you will have uh, chief ministers from the Pahad. So that is the tension right now. How many states in the Tarai, uh, and, and, and also in the hills, where the states would have an identity component to it, whether the concerns and aspirations of the hill ethnic groups will be accommodated, is where the Nepali political process is stuck as we speak. And that's why we missed the deadline. So that political bargaining is happening. Uh, the last elections threw up a certain kind of electoral mandate. I think uh, there is a new balance of power. And uh, Madhesis, and my sympathies are of course with them, will not get everything they want. The Maoists will not get everything they want. They will have to moderate their demands. At the same time, if the Nepali Congress and UML feel that the last elections which they won can reverse the aspiration for inclusion, then they are mistaken. Because uh, you know electoral cycles, as I said earlier, are unpredictable. They, they may just lose the next time. And the mandate of the people's movement, the mandate of the uh, interim constitution, the mandate of uh, the Madhesi movement is that Nepal should be a federal, democratic, inclusive democracy, right, and a, a republic. So, uh, so that within that framework, uh, certain compromises have to be made, which are not being made, right. Why, why do you think Nepal figures so high on the list of priorities for Mr. Modi? Uh, you know, foreign policy figures pretty high on his uh, priority list, right? I mean, he spent more time outside India than in India in the last six months. So he's been, he's, and neighborhood is a big thing. Uh, he, and, and except Pakistan, where I, I personally think that he's made a mistake, but except Pakistan, he has focused a lot on the neighborhood. I mean, he has, despite the fact that BJP was the one which opposed the land boundary uh, agreement with Bangladesh, he has now turned that around and he's willing to sign a deal with them. Uh, in, uh, he's had, he met Rajapaksa twice, he met the Tamil National Alliance, he no, there is now a government in Colombo that, that India is more comfortable with. Uh, he's got, his first visit was to Bhutan. And, and then he's gone to Nepal twice, once for, once for Sark and once on a bilateral visit. So I think neighborhood figures big, and I think that's, that's, that's laudable. I mean, this is, this is what foreign policy is. I mean, what, how does it matter to India what's happening in, you know, uh, this, this, India is the regional power. What happens in these countries across borders has a direct am impact on India. And it, the Indian establishment has always been deeply invested in the neighborhood, but what had happened was that Manmohan Singh was not investing political capital into it. And he was not traveling to these places. He never made a bilateral visit to, uh, to Nepal, for instance. And, and uh, Modi is correcting that. The other thing that, that may be at the root of it, and this I'm speculating here, is that there is this cultural connect, right? And, and uh, it suits his Hindutva politics as well. To go to Pashupati Nath and come out in a saffron robe is uh, music to his uh, supporters here. And uh, to go to Janakpur, which he was not able to do, and perhaps announce an Ayodhya to Janakpur uh, road track, is again music to his Hindutva base. So there is this, uh, uh, there is perhaps this worldview where Nepal is seen as an extension of the larger Hindu empire that RSS has uh, been uh, dreaming of. Uh, so that may be at the root of it, but, uh, but this focus on the neighborhood is actually pretty good. <coughs> Here, in the front, please. We promise that we'll come back. Can you make it brief? Uh, while addressing the second Constituent Assembly of Nepal, recently a Prime Minister uh, made a 40-minute speech. I mean, there was a whole 40-minute speech. He talked about sovereign democratic republic, but he never used the term secular. And as you said while uh, in your conversation a little, uh, little bit earlier, uh, that uh, uh, Nepal is very important for India, and India is definitely going to have a role there in the constitution making, finally. And, uh, and as what you said right now, that 
coming out of Pashupati Nath and wearing a saffron dress. So what do we, what do we actually expect of Nepal? Uh, finally, whenever they table a constitution, what do we expect of Nepal? A, a Hindu Rashtra or a secular state? You know, that's a good question. The, the, the thing is that uh, the government has played it smart. The RSS wants Nepal to become a Hindu Rashtra again. Uh, they were very. They want India to become the Hindu Rashtra. Yeah, they want India to become a Hindu Rashtra. And uh, the, but the, what is happening is that at the organization level, if somebody from RSS goes to Kathmandu, and RSS has a big wing there, the Hindu, the Pracharaks in Kathmandu, there are equal vidyalayas run in Nepal. When they meet Nepali political actors, they say, "Kya kar diya aap logon ne yaar? Ye to Hindu Rashtra hai. Kyu bana diya secular aap logon ne?" But the government does not use the BJP government has not used the diplomatic machinery to push this message. They have been, I think they've made this distinction, and I think it's a good distinction. <laughs> they have never, Modi has never raised the issue of Hindu Rashtra. When Sushma Swaraj was in Kathmandu, and, and she was asked, and you know, people in Kathmandu also, to play to this gallery, to play to the new gallery in Delhi, uh, say that let's make this a Hindu Rashtra. Sushma Swaraj said that I have taken oath under a secular constitution, and I'm not in this business. So the government is not doing this, and I think that, and, and, and the RSS is, and, and this, what, what, what the Sangh says is that uh, their effort is to create awareness and consciousness, and at some point, they hope that this becomes a Hindu Rashtra. Uh, and, and there are now, there is a rise in the Nepali right wing, so there are domestic political forces also which want a Hindu Rashtra, but as of now, that is still a weak strand, and Nepal, if we manage to do a constitution anytime soon, we will be secular. One more question I think we have time for. Then you can buttonhole Mr. Jai as he is heading towards his lunch, perhaps on this side now. And just if there are two questions we can take. If they are brief. Hi. Uh, Ask your question. My question is, uh, when Nepal, it, whenever it intends to execute its own constitution, given India's uh, you know, influence in Nepal, and you are quite pro-India's influence, do you think the provision of reservations or enabling provisions or special provisions would be dragged in in the, Nepali's in the Nepali constitution and how would that affect the politics there and the ethnic uh, diversity there? Provision for reservation for whom? For groups, for women, for children, the way we have it in Indian constitution. Yeah, yeah. you know, there is already affirmative action in uh, in Nepal. There is a there is a law which uh, mandates reservation in the civil service and in security forces. And of course, I, I support it. I think the affirmative action is essential. And and uh, the Nepali state, as I've kept saying, has been dominated by select communities, and uh, this is not sustainable. I mean, the the, the democratic uh, aspiration of the different excluded groups um, have to be accommodated, and and aff affirmative action is essential. This is the last question. Now here again, on the left-hand side in the aisle, the gentleman with the specs. Yeah, hi. Uh, I frequently travel to Nepal and not only Kathmandu to the remote areas for business purpose. Uh, what I have seen in last uh, two, three months recently that uh, there is a, uh, this, I want to talk about Maoist, this, uh, uh, that there, there is a drift and the split between Prachand between Viplav and Viplim saying that I'm going to the jungles and he's asking donations for the arms and uh, everything. So do you really see this drift and the split is serious or it could be a, a source of like a, a policy also that Prachand being sitting in the assembly and the politics and Viplav going to the jungle and they are talking, uh, taking this, you know, the whole thing. And secondly, I would like to ask, uh, but how do you think Chinese influence in past uh, or in Nepal and uh, Maori's relationship with the Chinese people and their this thing on uh, uh, this uh, constitution? Uh, both good questions. There can never be a discussion on Nepal and India without asking the China question. Uh, I'll take the first one. Uh, you know, the, the split is serious. It's not a good cop, bad cop act. It is, uh, it is a serious split because it's driven by the fundamental ideological tension within the Maoist movement. Was it right to engage in open democratic politics and institutionalize the achievements that were possible, which is republic? Or should they have continued on the path of the protracted people's war? The orthodox Maoists still believe they made a mistake. They point to the lack of a constitution, they point to the electoral setback, they point to uh, the weaknesses of the movement to say, look, you made a mistake. You should ne we should never have got into this cesspool of parliamentary democracy. And so this is Biplav's line. Babu Ram Bhattra and Prachan's line is that this was what was uh, achievable at that point. A military victory was not possible. The international context would not have allowed us to take over Kathmandu ever. 
And so these are substantial achievements. The Republic is a substantial achievement. Let's write a constitution. This is a fundamental tension. If we don't do a constitution, then the extreme left becomes stronger. So the constitution is an important thing also to, uh, to strengthen the more moderate line within the Maoists. So that's the, that's the, the that's answer to your question. Uh, the, second, the second thing about China, look, China's engagement in Nepal is growing and will grow. India has to live with it. And India has to find ways to cope with it. If China's influence in Africa is growing, China will, of course, engage with its neighbor. We are a neighbor of China. We have a, we have a very long border with China. And we have a border with China in the areas where they are most vulnerable, which is Tibet. China's interest in Nepal is driven by its Tibet policy. There are 20,000 Tibetan residents in, China, uh, in Nepal. This is the route that Tibetans used to come to Dharamshala, go back. The Chinese, fee, and that the, the March 2008 was a turning point when there were free Tibet protests that erupted both in Lhasa and in Kathmandu. In Lhasa, they were able to quell it. In Kathmandu, it continued. International media arrived there, beamed images live, and the Chinese got very alarmed. So the Chinese influence there is driven by the need to have leverage over, Nepali gov over the Nepali government and uh, over Nepali political parties so that they can call up the Nepali, any party which is in power and say, crack down on the Tibetans. That is the fundamental objective of the Chinese and India. <coughs> but they will, of course, deepen economic engagement. They will deepen uh, political, uh, political engagement. The question is, is the Chinese strategic objective in Nepal, does it conflict with India's? And I would argue no. China also wants stability in India and India also, uh, in Nepal, and India also wants stability in Nepal. Uh, what is not known is that the Chinese and the Indian ambassador in Kathmandu meet every two months for lunch. They have, they, 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 you know, when, when elections were delayed in Nepal, both of them said, have an election. Both Mr. Modi and the Chinese say, have a constitution by consensus now. So there are, there are, of course, spheres when they will, there will be conflict and competition, but there are also spheres when India and China can work together. India, look, China will increase its influence across South Asia. Delhi will have to find ways to cope with it. Thank you. It's been a thank fascinating you. discussion. Thank you, Prashant. Thank, thank you, you Kai. sir. Thank you, Kai. And thank you, folks. I'd like to thank.